Welcome back to another episode of Explain Yourself. I'm at the National ComSci Con, so that's the Communicating Science Conference in Boston, and I'm with Ariana Soldati from the University of Missouri, and we're going to talk about geology, which is a little different than a lot of the other inter interviews on here, but I am super excited. So, uh, Ariana, can you, um, we've been doing pop talks at this conference, so can you give us your elevator pitch for your current research? Oh, absolutely. So I study lava flows. I want to figure out how they move and how fast they move. And this is very important because there are about 500 million people who live within 30 kilometers of an active volcano worldwide. So they are potentially impacted by lava flows and we want to figure out kind of like how much of a warning can we give them once there is an eruption happening? How long do they have to evacuate while it is still safe? Okay, that's awesome. That sounds super important. I had no idea that there were, I mean, I think about, because we were having a conversation about this earlier. Yeah, there are certain places in the world. I mean, Hawaii has been in the news recently, but I didn't realize it was that many people. So this is really important for a large segment of people. Wow, okay. It is, yeah, we don't really think about it, but even just in the United States, you know, Hawaii, the current eruption has already taken out 600 plus homes, unfortunately, and so those are all people that at different times the civil protection has had to tell them, hey, it is time to get your most like precious and critical belongings and get to safety. Mm, okay, so how do you go about telling how fast lava flows move? Do they all move at the same speed or are there different things about the chemistry or the structure of the lava that change the speed? Right, not all lava flows are the same. So um, usually lava flows move slow enough that people can easily outrun or even outwalk okay. them. <laughs> so we're talking like five, 10 kilometers per hour, so that's not very much. But unfortunately, there have been cases of lava flows that have moved much further uh, than that, and they have been dangerous to people and have uh, killed people. Uh, namely, there's a couple of famous cases, and they're all at um, near a Gongo volcano in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, that volcano is a little bit different because there is a lava lake, and the lava inside it is very fluid, and it breached overnight. So all of a sudden, there was this really uh, fluid thin lava that was moving very very fast and it was coming down um, a really steep slope and so um, people got caught up mm. in that uh, that was moving <clears throat> at about 60 kilometers per hour so that that's really way faster fast. okay yeah. Um, yeah wow I yeah I guess I've, I've seen video of people at the volcanoes of Hawaii or whatever going tourist and yeah you can just walk around it and it gloops so slowly but 60 kilometers an hour is really fast okay right and that really like depends <laughs> as you were mentioning before um, on the chemistry of the volcano um, namely how much um, silica there is in it so if you don't have a lot and by a lot I mean like 50% or so then it's more fluid so you can move faster and then the more you have uh, of that silica in the air, the sticker, the more viscous it becomes and so it moves uh, slower and that gives you a little bit more time to move out of the way. Okay, and yeah, silica is a, a mineral, I guess, or? Yeah, so it's um, <laughs> an atom of silicon and four oxygens around it and that's kind of like the basic unit of what makes up, we call them silicate melts and so those are uh, lava but also glass, for example, in sure. windows, yeah. that's, that's the same thing. Or parts of my cell phone or my laptop, right? So this exactly. is an incredibly common element on Earth, but a lot of it is in the rocks, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, so what determines the percentage of silica that winds up in this lava that then changes its uh, texture and how fast it flows? Right, so all volcanoes um, are different. We only have volcanoes at very special places on Earth where we can have uh, some melting uh, of the rock occur. Um, and so, for example, Hawaii is what we call um, a hotspot volcano. So that means that there is uh, magma that rises from very deep inside the mantle, inside the earth 
dirt um, and gets to the surface and erupts and makes lava flows. But that's not uh, the only context in which we can form <coughs> volcanoes. There's also uh, subduction zone volcanoes. So, for example, that's um, if you think about all the cascades, but then uh, even lower down all um, the Chilean coast. Mm -hmm. So you have one plate of the earth that goes beneath another. Um, and so that also causes melting and it's it's a different chemistry okay. so uh, volcanoes <coughs> have more or less silica depending on where they form and and what causes that that melt to form there that makes sense okay so what specifically are you doing to sort of study all of this? So my main um, objective in research is to try and match what we observe in nature and the measurements that we can get in the lab. Because the problem with volcanic eruptions is that they are sort of natural experiments, but they are like one off. Mm -hmm. It happens, the <laughs> volcano decides all the conditions, you know, um, the chemistry can be different depending on which volcano you're at, but also the slope of the volcano, it can be more gentle or more steep. Um, and then, you know, you can have a different temperature at which the lava comes out. There can be only a little bit of, or a lot of it at the same time you don't control any of that and it usually doesn't happen while you are there I right mean, <laughs> hopefully uh, not <laughs> right so um in in the lab on on the contrary you can control all of that you know you can control uh the temperature you can control the chemistry but how do you match the two it's not an easy task you could think oh you just upscale that it's it's really difficult to do that um, so I try to observe in nature how fast lava flows move and this tells me something you know about um, how viscous how sticky they are and then I try to make that viscosity measurements in the lab and re-extrapolate that back to how fast the lava flow would move in a natural scenario. So that um, the aim of that is that, you know, we could go to a volcano that's not erupting. So when it's safe, there is no immediate concern. We could grab a sample, take it back to the lab, measure its viscosity, and then be ready for an eruptive scenario. If there's an eruption happening, what can we expect? How much time do we have? Awesome. So you're basically setting up um, the ability for us to predict so that we can warn people. Right. Okay. And I'll be honest, this is kind of like a long term goal. You know, it's not <laughs> something that's going to be achieved in the next couple of years, right. but that's what we're working towards. Okay. And um, so you say you take samples back to the lab and we were talking about this earlier. So what is the sort of like process when you go out and do your field work and collect those samples. How do you do that? So that's the very exciting part of the work. <laughs> that's what people always picture, you know, oh, you're a volcanologist, so you go out to an active lava flow all the time. It is not all the time. <laughs> I wish uh, it's actually, you know, if I'm lucky, one or two weeks out mm -hmm. of the year. Uh, but we go out to a volcano and we hope that it's active at the time when we go out, which is counterintuitive. <laughs> um, but we get up real close to, to the lava flow and, and we take a sample. And the way to do that, honestly, you just go with a hammer and, and you scoop it up. Um, and the first time I did that, it was a very interesting experience because I thought it was just <laughs> going to be like scooping up really um, sticky syrup. Mm -hmm. It's not like that at all. You know, uh, we always imagine lava is molten because that's what we are taught. And I mean, yes, there is a liquid component to it, but there's um, also a lot of solid crystals inside and some gas bubbles and and that makes it really more solid like as a feel so you actually have to hammer it out pretty hard it's mm. like collecting um a cold rock sample uh, and you have to be fast at that because <laughs> the lava is really hot it's about 1200 um degrees celsius or like 2000 fahrenheit uh, i think yeah 100 c would be 212 fahrenheit so the boiling temperature of water right yeah 
So, I mean, That's it really is hot. ridiculously <laughs> hot, and so you get up like from here to there, and, and it's burning you out, like just the radiative heat, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot to take. So, um, get real close, and um, while you're doing it, you're not even really looking at what you're doing because your eyes are really like sensitive to the temperature, so you're kind of looking away. <laughs> um, and after you've like separated a, a piece of lava from the lava flow, you pour a lot of water on it because um, you want to quench it and that means you just kind of want to freeze in place uh, everything about the structure of the lava. Okay. You want to like take a snapshot of how it is um, when it's active and then when it's cold you can pick it up and bring it back. That way it doesn't like melt a hole in your field vehicle, right? <laughs> yes, very important yeah, objective. Yeah, I can imagine. So, um, so you say it's hot. like. Uh, what sort of um, like field clothing and safety equipment do you wear when you're going out there to scoop lava? <laughs> like, do you have to wear? Um, I think some people might picture like the, the big bomb suits, you know, to protect you from the heat. Do you have something like that, or it is a little, a little more low key? <laughs> right. So, like in an ideal world, I would definitely be wearing that. Uh, the problem with it is um, logistical, to be honest, you know, uh, you usually have to walk quite a long way to your <laughs> field site, you know, you might have to hike for uh, four or five hours mm. and that gear is very bulky and very heavy and there's already a lot of other things that you have to carry with you in the field, you know, namely water, not just to drink, but also to quench sure. those samples. Um, so you usually just go at it with some kind of like long sleeve um, shirt mm -hmm. and, and gloves and you try to pick uh, a natural material like uh, like cottons that you know sure. it, it doesn't burn, doesn't melt on your skin and just tough it out and try to do it as fast as you possibly can. Cool, so I mean field work is field work. <laughs> yes. So um, yeah that's awesome and uh, we also were talking, so you, you know, you've got this lovely dress on and you were saying before that you're sort of a girl's girl. Um, so can you share with us your perspective on how that interacts with you being a volcanologist specifically and doing field work in general? Yeah, so that's a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, in, in life, I like to wear dresses and, and high heels. And of course, you know, um, that's, that's doesn't match the, the expectation in, in the field. And of course, in the field, you know, I wear boots and field clothes. You don't like, go hiking in your high heels? No, I don't. <laughs> not practical. Uh, but, uh, but there's still, you know, other ways to still be feminine in the field that absolutely do not interfere uh, with your field work. Like, you know, like putting your hair up or doing your makeup or whatever makes you, uh, makes you feel comfortable. And that's, you know, that is perfectly fine. And, and it's okay to kind of have this, um, this split between how you are um, in an academic setting, where it is at a conference or, or in a lab, or in the field, there is no reason why you cannot like switch back between the two as, as it's convenient and necessary. That's fair. Yeah. So again, literally anybody can be a scientist. Oh, we yeah. have all different personalities and all different likes. Um, so switching gears a little bit, just thinking about everybody can be a scientist. Um, so you're a doctoral student right now, right? So you're pursuing your PhD. Um, but you said you've only been here in the United States for the three years that you've been a doctoral student, right? Uh, five years. Five years. Actually, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Longer, okay. But... Um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about how you wound up here? Like, why why come do your PhD on volcanoes in the United States? Yeah, that's actually a really good story. <laughs> uh, there's not very many volcanologists in the world. Uh, if you're looking for a number, I would say about 1,500. That's how many of us there were at our last, you know, uh, big um, discipline conference sure. last year. Um, and so we're all on a mailing list and when there is a PI who has a grant funded and is looking for some students, he or she usually sends an email around to the community and says, hey, would anybody be interested in, in this project? <laughs> and, that's, and that's what happened to me, you know, I was a master's student in, in my last year and I was looking into a PhD program and, and my advisor had a project funded and I read the description and it involved field work at active volcanoes and you know there were a number of things that made it really attractive to me and I just read it and it clicked it was what I wanted to do so I got in touch with him and I applied and and eventually got in and I know it's really counterintuitive because you know we don't really have 
active volcanoes in in Missouri where I am. <laughs> right. but it's okay because you get to escape the very brutal winter and mm -hmm. go to nice places like Central America. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, so yeah, that's that's one of the interesting things, I guess, about being in a sort of a niche or a sub-discipline, right? That you've got this very robust community of researchers. So what is it, what's it like to go to that conference and meet all of the other volcanologists in the entire world? It is a very nice experience. <laughs> so. Um, my first year was kind of weird, you know, I didn't know anyone there, so I was just, you know, going to the talks and going to the poster session, but it actually didn't take me very long to, uh, to start meeting people and, and making friends, and now going to conferences, really meeting with my community again, and then, you know, people I've worked with or, or I've met before, and it's kind of like a family reunion almost, <laughs> because the the size is really small so it kind of like allows for those personal interactions and it is very nice nice awesome and um so you grew up in italy i don't know a whole lot about how you know the schooling that you went through before coming here might have been different so can you talk a little bit about um your undergrad experience and your master's experience and like how did you become a volcanologist <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um i've always been into volcanoes since since I was a kid, okay. you know, and it's, it's one of those things, you know, early fascination, there was a big eruption on TV, kind of got my imagination and, and it stayed with me throughout and um, so I guess the, the main differences start with how you pick your major because in Italy you have to declare that like the moment you enroll into college. Ah. Um, so I kind of had to know what I wanted to do before even being a freshman and when the moment to decide came, I was just like, you know, geology has been something I've been interested with all my life since I can remember, so there's a good chance I will love it as a career, you know, um, and, and I'm happy with my choice so far, it's been good. So I picked geology because that's kind of like the, the first step before you can specialize and, and go into volcanoes and then um, I did that in, in Pavia which is kind of like a smaller college town nearby my, my hometown which is Milan because I met this um, fantastic professor there who was just like really keen on fostering my interest into, into volcanoes. I remember going into his office and, and talking to him when I was still in high school and he was telling me about the latest a volcano documentary that he saw and, and I hadn't seen that so he just mailed me a DVD with the documentary. <laughs> I mean I wasn't even a student yet, right? Um, so we were off to a really good start and, and then um, after getting my bachelor's I, I moved to a different town, Pisa, for, um, for a master's because there aren't so many programs in right. Italy when you can get that, you know, it's, it's fairly specific. <laughs> And uh, um, and then, you know, I did some experiences abroad. I, I was in Paris for a while and then I was in Bristol in England and, and then decided to make the, the big jump to, to the US. I, I'd lived here before and I, I knew I really liked the culture and there was this fantastic opportunity so I decided to take it. Awesome. Um, so you've got some great things to say about your advisor or one of your former advisors. Yeah. So. Um, Part of this series, of course, is talking about what it's like to be a grad student and especially helping people who might be interested in becoming grad students. So what what do you look for in an advisor or, you know, what what have been sort of the best characteristics of the advisors that you've had? I would say that um, what I've really liked and, and appreciated in my advisors is the support into doing what I wanted to. So for example, uh, my advisor for my PhD has allowed me to pursue kind of like my line of research. There was a set project when I arrived, but then I kind of wanted to take it into different directions and he's been very supportive of that. Um, and he's also been very supportive of um, my efforts in, in science communication and things that are normally considered a little bit tangential to, to your research and that is very very important to me and um, it's been really positive that he has understood the value of that and he's and he supported that. Yeah, that's so being supportive is so important. Yeah, um, but I like what you said about being able to sort of take the research in your own direction too. That's something that's both scary and exciting about being a doctoral student, right? Is that you have to sort of start to figure out what you want to ask questions about. Yeah. Definitely. Like he was always there as a safety net. If an idea was really never going to work, <laughs> he said that. But 
you know, if he thought it was it was cool and he and he might have a chance, hey, let me try it out. And and I think that's really how you learn because. You know, come September, I'm gonna start a postdoc and I'm gonna be on my own. So it's, it's my responsibility <laughs> to, to decide what I want to do. So that's so it's exciting. Been good training. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and yeah, you mentioned your science communication interest. That's why we're here at this conference. Um, so, where can people find some science communication that you've already created? I know you've been doing some writing and stuff. So, yeah, so um, most recently I've taken up, you know, blogging and, and writing for uh, science communication channels but um, I would say that my main project has been Science on Wheels and it is um, a program that goes out to rural communities in Missouri and tries to get people talking about science and I specifically look at uh, those people adults in particular who are usually kind of left behind in the science communication effort. Mm. Um, so I live in Columbia, Missouri and it is a very vibrant town. There are a ton of, of opportunities for people who want to hear more about science. Um, but then I realized that it's enough to drive out like 30 minutes and and everything changes dramatically. <laughs> There's no Saturday morning science, no science on tap, like none of these like cool programs happening there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you kind of like have to put yourself in, in the shoes of those people. I mean, after a long work day, would you want to like drive 30 minutes each way to, to listen to some grad students talk about science? Right. Like, hey, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, so, you know, I decided that it was a good idea for us to do the drive and, and meet them right where they are uh, and give them the chance to, to meet some scientists because most, most people have never met a scientist and, and that's a pity, I think we're yeah. cool. So. <laughs> Um, and, and people have reacted very, very positively to oh. that. They're usually really excited to see what we're doing. They're excited, you know, that we're willing to, to meet them right where they are. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's what I've been working on. And in fact, this summer, kind of like as a bridge between my PhD and my postdoc, I'm working on expanding the program and making sure that it lives on after I've um, moved on. That's so exciting. You bring the science right to people who might not otherwise be able to access it, right? So, yeah. I, I think, yeah, that, that is very important because we cannot really um, expect that people will come and, and seek that out because sometimes it's just not feasible. You know how it is, you get busy with your life and it is important that science is right there and accessible where you are. Yeah, nice. Um, and this is sort of a, yeah, as you're thinking about reaching out to the community and talking to different kinds of people, um, grad school is a journey. <laughs> and um, is there anything that you would like to tell your younger self? Like if you could, you know, tell your younger self, hey, you need to watch out for this or hey, this is something you should know before you start this. Like what would you what would you tell someone in your place just starting out? Uh, it turns out better than than you think at the beginning, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So I'm a perfectionist and going into grad school it was really hard to learn how the whole peer review process works and so even uh, friendly and constructive critiques that were coming from my advisor were really hard at the beginning. Uh, and it's taken me you know a few rounds to learn that hey this is actually like a positive part of the process. Um, so yeah I relaxed a little bit and, and, and trust that it is, in fact, going to, to make your paper better and your work <laughs> better. Uh, yeah, but I think everybody has to figure that out for themselves, you know, uh, because if you like your work, which, you know, most people hopefully do, <laughs> do you know, they're really hopefully. passionate about it, so it all feels very, very personal. Uh, it is like trusting that everybody there is on your team and is helping you make it better. Yeah, I think that's important advice because yeah, a lot of us that are motivated to do this, we are perfectionists. <laughs> you can't yes. you can't take it all personally or you'd never get anywhere with it, right? You'd just be sort of depressed all the time. And I like what you said about your team too. So how do you um, how do you sort of see the relationship that you have with um, your advisor and any other graduate students and if you have any undergrads that help you in the lab, like how, how does that team sort of work for what you do? 
Right, so um, I would say that um, I, in my experience, so my team has been like really um, small. So there's my advisor, and there's always been um, between one and three other uh, PhD students like me, like in different stages. And we've had you know the occasional undergrad who helps in the in the lab, but that hasn't been like a constant presence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I would say that um, it is very important to have people both who are like further along in the journey than you and and also people who are like coming in at a later stage um, because I've really learned the value of passing your knowledge down uh -huh. so um, of course you know my advisor is really busy with making sure that the lab runs and then uh, there's enough grant money to go around for everybody <laughs> so um, I've learned a lot from the PhD student who was like kind of like one year ahead of me and then I've also passed that the knowledge down once we've had the new students come and that has been very positive because it has really made me feel like I was um, part of a team like we're doing things together yeah and as, um, the best way to be sure that you know something is to have to teach it to somebody else right? oh, it is. <laughs> Absolutely, and I find that to be very rewarding, honestly, you know, taking time to sit down with someone who is new to working with that particular instrument and be like, hey, this is how it works, those are the problems that I've run into and these are some possible solutions. That's awesome. All right. Um, and so you said uh, after you're done with your doctorate, you're going to do a postdoc, so what is your sort of like career plan for yourself? Where do you see yourself headed? Um, I would really like to stay in academia because for me, you know, it has been um, a great experience so far and I'm really into the, the research aspect and would like to do more of that. Uh, but I also see uh, science communication as something that I definitely want to be part of, of my career journey I had. Uh, so I hope I'll be able uh, to keep doing that on the side but not so much on the side because <laughs> I think it is very important to uh, you know share our science not only with our peers at conferences I mean that's amazing of course but um, we also need to give back to the public our research is uh, is funded by the public and it is ultimately meant to, to benefit the public sure, yeah. <laughs> so we might as well you know, keep them up to date on our progress. Exactly, and volcanoes are exciting. Like they are. Like <laughs> I've never met a single person who wasn't excited about that. <laughs> oh, that makes your job easier. Yes, it does. I mean, you you talk to people on a plane. You know, they ask, "Hey, what are you into?" And, and you see volcanoes, and everybody's like, "What?" They're mind blown. You know, <laughs> they're they've usually never met a volcanologist before. Uh, I've met a lot of people who didn't think that that was even a job, right? that could yeah. even be a career, so it's kind of good to be the one who's like, hey, we exist, you know, that's an option. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so is there anything else that you think is really important for people to know about your journey to becoming a scientist or the science that you do, you know, the, the really important bit that people should know? I think that um, in science you're very much curiosity driven no matter uh, what specific field you go into so as long as you have that you're going to be okay uh, if you have that that motivation within you then you will find people along the way who help you get all those other skills that that you need um, to make it <laughs> that was yeah that is very well said yeah um, so I'd like to thank Ariana for hanging out with us and telling us all about her amazing volcano research. Thank you! Thank you for having me! It was a lot of fun. Uh, so if you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.